Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Good morning and welcome to all the folks at the video venue across the street and all you folks that are joining us online today. It's great to have you here. If you got a Bible, I want you to take it and turn to the Gospel of Matthew and find the 8th chapter. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. Gospel of Matthew, the 8th chapter, we're going to continue this New Year's series called Rediscovering Jesus. We're talking about uh, learning or maybe being reminded of who Jesus is and what Jesus has to offer to ordinary people like you and me. And I told you from the beginning that my, my hope or my goal in this study is that would challenge everybody from those who are just curious about Jesus all the way to those who are deeply committed to Jesus to have a deeper understanding of who He is and a deeper commitment to follow Him. Well, while you're turning there, you know, let me share something with you. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, uh, I like to go to Pacers games. My daughter, Trisha, and I go to a lot of Pacers games. We enjoy doing that together. And I'm thinking about incorporating something they do at the Pacers games into our weekend services. And you can just, you can just give me your feedback. I think it would be cool to have a fan cam in weekend services. So you got somebody, you know, kind of sneaking around with a camera, just catching random shots of people and putting them up on the screen during the service. Now, you go to a Pacers game, anytime somebody sees themselves on the screen, they just act like a complete, make a fool of themselves in that moment, you know, on the screen. And I think, you know, that could add some real interesting uh, dynamics to weekend services. And why stop there? I think we could have a uh, kiss cam on uh, weekend services. Only we would do it, we would call it a holy kiss cam. And just in case you think that's way off base, that's in the book. The book, it says to greet one another with a holy kiss in the Scriptures. Now, we would want that to be confined to just husbands and wives in church, but um, don't you think that would be interesting? It would. It really would. And by the way, we have a fan cam of sorts for this service right now because it's broadcast online, and you don't know it, but sometimes you're broadcast all over the country online, and it's pretty embarrassing when it's like this. And that happens from time to time. It's inexplicable to me. I just don't know how it could happen. But it happens from time to time. I just think, you know, we guys got to be open to just about anything to add a little bit of uh, spice to the service. So you you mull that over and give me your thoughts on that sometime later. You know, so far in this series, we've pretty much focused our attention on what Jesus can do for us. In fact, The very first week of the series, the title of the message was literally what Jesus wants to do for you. And then last week when we were together, we talked about the power of having a personal encounter with Jesus and how when we have a personal encounter with Jesus and we come to him in faith, it literally can change our lives. I want to kind of go in a little bit of a different direction this weekend, and I want to talk more about what Jesus expects from us because the truth is Jesus has so much to offer us so much to add to our lives, but he can't do that unless we're committed to him completely, unless we have complete faith and trust in him. And so we need to talk about that a little bit and what his expectations are for us. And so if you got your Bibles open there to Matthew chapter 8, go ahead and stand together with me. Uh, Like we always do, if you're a guest with us, we're so glad you're here. But we believe so strongly in the power of the Word of God that we make the public reading of the Bible a part of every service when we come to this point in the service. I'm going to begin reading in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. And it's a little bit different today because we're going to read different scenes here in the life of Jesus. And you could actually preach a sermon on every one of these, but we're going to put them all together, and it's going to make sense to you when we get into the message. But starting with verse 18. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that The waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. When he arrived at the other side, 
in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Okay, you can be seated. May... God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word today. You know, one of the biggest problems we have with Christianity today is that there are a lot of people who think that being a Christian is nothing more than just simply embracing Jesus on some level, on some level. Actually, that's a problem that we have mostly here in the U.S. and the western part of the world. I travel around the world and visit mission partners and meet Christians in different parts of the world, and I don't really see this nominal Christianity in other parts of the world where it's literally in so many situations dangerous to become a Christian. You have to be serious about putting your faith in Christ because it could cost you everything in some places. But salvation is so much more than that. It's so much more than just embracing Jesus on some level. It's not enough just to have positive feelings toward Jesus. It's not enough just to admire him or celebrate him or even promote him on some level in some way. The only way to become a genuine Christian, a genuine follower of Christ, is to completely surrender to him. I mean surrender with abandon everything to him. That's what the Bible teaches us. This past week, I was over at the Community Ministry Center. It was Impact Thursday, where we have sessions on Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, and Thursday evening, where folks come to us for food and clothing, and I was sharing from the word with the people there, and I was talking to them about having a reason for living, which is something we all need to think about from time to time, make sure that we have a a proper, a good, a solid reason for living. And uh, I used a passage of Scripture, a very brief passage from Matthew chapter 4, to help describe what a good reason for living would be. This is what it says there in verses 18 through 20. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his Brother Andrew, they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And then it goes on to say, and at once they left their nets, and they followed him. And I was talking to them about how to have a reason for living from those words. But those words also show us the steps that we take for genuine salvation. And those steps would just be this. Number one, you've got to commit to following Jesus. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. Commit to following Jesus. It's not just some one-time action or one-time event in your life. It's embracing everything that that means. And then the second thing is commit to embracing Jesus' life and Jesus' purpose and Jesus' will. He said, follow me. And then what did he say next? He said, and I will make you, say it with me. He said, I will make you fishers of men. Not just come follow me, but come follow me purposefully. Come follow me and do in your lives what's most important to me, and that is reaching people. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You've got to follow him and embrace what he values and what his will is for your life. And then the third thing is you need to commit to doing it now. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the text said that at once. Everyone say at once. At once they left their nets and they followed him. At once. I think that's a good biblical picture of what it means to really follow Jesus. But this is not what we see in the lives of so many people who take the name Christian in just a generic sense without any real implied commitment. A lot of people think that they're Christians because they were born in America or because they come from a Christian family or a Christian tradition or because they went through confirmation classes when they were young or they follow some kind of of instruction in their local church. They walk down an aisle, they make a confession, they pray a prayer, even are baptized, something like that. But Jesus calls for a deeper commitment from us than just participating in some kind of a one-time action or one-time event And the commitment is really summed up by those words, follow me, follow me. They mean so much. Towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a bold, really bold statement about 
the reality of whether or not our faith is genuine. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. We'll see it on the screen. In fact, I want you to read this with me. I want to hear your voices. Jesus said, here we go. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. Let's just leave that up there for a second. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, and that sounds pretty impressive. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only he. Here's the key, and this is what why there's so much more to following Jesus than just having an experience in the moment. He says, everyone who does the will of my Father, the will of the Father is to follow with abandon. But, but honestly, what does that really mean for people like you and me today? What does that really mean? I have a book in my study called Radical, written by a guy named David Platt. It's been out for a while. It's been a very popular book. He really talked about the kind of radical commitment to Christ calls for in the New Testament. And here's just a little section from that book. He writes and says, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the eager followers of Jesus in the first century. This is where we come face to face with a dangerous reality. We do have to give up everything we have to follow Jesus. We do have to love him in a way that makes our closest relationships in this world look like hate. And it is entirely possible that he will tell us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor. Following Jesus with abandon, that's what we're talking about. That's the mark of a genuine Christian. Not a one-time event or a one-time action. Following Jesus with abandon. Look at these words on the screen from Matthew chapter 10. Boy, these words are so strong. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now let's be honest. This morning I'll ask you a question. Don't answer out loud or raise your hand. But honestly, don't those words sound a little harsh? Almost overly harsh? They do. I'll say that they do. Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. Now, what he's talking about there in the very first part of the, that passage, when he's talking about not coming to bring peace but bringing a sword and, and, and turning, you know, sons against their fathers and mothers against their daughters and so on, is he's just talking about the fact that when it comes to making the commitment to follow him and to follow him with abandon, sometimes that causes us to make sacrifices in our lives. And sometimes they can be huge sacrifices, huge sacrifices. Because one of the things we have to do when we decide that we're going to follow Jesus with abandon is we have to examine the loyalties in our lives. And we have to examine the loves in our lives. Because when it comes to loyalty, Jesus wants us to be loyal to him above all else. And when it comes to love, he expects us to love him more than anything else. So much so that our other loves pale in comparison. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about sacrifice, and sometimes that sacrifice comes in our families. Sometimes it creates conflict. conflict. And again, that's why he said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Following Jesus involves sacrifice. You know, when I was growing up, I have an older sister, just a few years older than I am. And, and uh, when we were growing up, uh, she met a, a, a young man who came to church with a friend of hers who had absolutely no church background, no spiritual background at all. His family was a long, long way from God. But a friend had invited him to church, and he started to come, and he became good friends with my sister. And he came back every week to church. He just, he just soaked up everything that was being said and everything that was being offered, from the message of Christ to the fellowship, the friendships, the nurturing that he received in the church. And that summer, we went to Christ in Youth Conference as a, as a youth group. Uh, which is still around today. Our kids are going to go to Christ in Youth Conference this summer. They don't, they don't usually use that term anymore. They call, it's called MOVE this year, and I think we'll see an advertisement for it on MPTV coming up at the end of the service. But it's a life-changing event. And we went there, and he, he was really captured by what happened. And one evening, he responded to an invitation. He went down forward. He decided, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to follow Christ, and I want to do it with abandon. And when we went back to church the next Sunday, he came back down front again at the end.
end of the service, he made a public profession of his faith in Christ. He was baptized into Christ and all that. But his family was so anti-church and so anti-Christianity that they told him, this guy, he's like somewhere 15, 16 years old. They said, if you're going to follow Christ, you're not going to be a part of our family. Literally. And he moved in with another family in our church, and he lived with them until he graduated from high school. Now, I lost track of him because my family ended up moving to Texas. But can you imagine? And this, but this is what Jesus was talking about. Listen, this is not just words on a page. And I bet there are other people here in this service or who are listening to me somewhere across the street or somewhere online who can tell similar stories. Because Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to follow me completely. If you're going to follow me, you're going to follow me with abandon. And here's the thing that you need to understand in advance. Sometimes that's going to require from you the deepest level of sacrifice, so much so that it's, going to, it's not going to create peace in your life. It's going to create conflict, sometimes even in your closest relationships. That's New Testament Christianity. But we just don't see that so much of the day, uh, so much of the time today, because we've created this middle class Jesus that we can follow at our convenience. And that's not the way it is. And so we're, that's what we're talking about here in this message. It's about getting our priorities straight. When we get our priorities straight in life, when we get our priorities straight in any area of life, what we realize is that there are certain things in life that we need to abandon because they're getting in the way. I read a book. A while back, some time ago, it's called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. It was written by a man named Mark McCormick, and here's just a little interesting excerpt. He said, if you want to be successful in business, you'll have to abandon the idea of a 40-hour work week. It takes longer than that to succeed. How many of you know that's true? If all you want to do is just punch a clock every week, uh, then you're only going to experience so much, so much success in life. He says, when two people get married, they abandon their past with a vow that says, forsaking all others, I pledge myself only to you. I'm not going to have multiple people in my life. I'm just going to have you. You're going to have my full commitment. When a couple has their first child, we had baby dedication last night. It made me chuckle. When a per couple has their first child, they abandon things as well, such as silence, sleeping through the night, watching a television show all the way through. I'll stop right there. And the idea is that these are all things that involves sacrifice on our part, and yet the sacrifice is worth it because of the reward that's offered. See, here's the deal. Jesus really offers us the opportunity to experience a level of greatness in life that's unlike anything that the world has to offer. The world offers greatness that's associated with fame or power or wealth or or fortune or something like that. Jesus offers a greatness that's so much deeper than that. It's found in abandon. It's found in serving. It's found in putting other people above yourself. And the reward is not experienced here in this lifetime. It's experienced in the life that is to come. But if you're going to experience that greatness, you've got to take Jesus seriously. And when you take him seriously, you see that there are some things that you need to abandon in your life. And that's where we get to Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, because what I want to do, and I promise I'll do this quickly. We've gotten out on time every service this weekend. I want to tell you four things that you need to abandon in your life if you're going to, if you're going to take Jesus seriously and you're going to live a commitment to him that is described by abandon, by following him with abandon, and you're going to experience the greatness that he offers. Right down next to number one, the first thing you have to abandon is empty promises. We, our, our text began with a teacher of the law talking to Jesus. Verse 18, or 19 rather, says, Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, now here's the bold statement. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, I can just imagine what took place in this setting that caused this teacher of the law to make such a bold statement. I imagine that he just experienced Jesus up close and personal for the first time in his life ever. And I'm sure it was an overwhelming experience for him. He heard Jesus speak and teach, and he had never heard anything like it before. What, what, what do we see about Jesus all throughout the Gospels? He didn't teach like the other rabbis. He taught as one who had authority. And so he heard Jesus teach and preach and speak, and it was fresh, and it was bold, and it was new, and it was authoritative, and it was compelling, and it captured him. And then, on top of that, he saw Jesus perform supernatural miracles that no one had ever seen before. 
This time Jesus was healing lepers and casting demons out of people and healing all kinds of sickness. And he saw that. And in the rush of the moment, in the rush of the emotion, he came to Jesus and he made this bold statement. He said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, in, in essence, looked at him and said, oh, really? He said, are you willing to be homeless? Are you willing to lose absolutely everything that you've ever had? And that might seem like a harsh way to respond, but Jesus basically knew that this man probably was caught up in the emotion of the moment and hadn't counted the cost of what he was saying. This is the same Jesus, by the way, who later in Matthew's gospel in chapter 16 and verse 24 would say, if anyone will come up after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus says following me comes with a cost. No one knew better than Jesus that oftentimes initial faith, even when it was declared boldly like it was with this man, is not always real faith. Sometimes it's shallow and superficial faith. This isn't on the PowerPoint, but there's a, there's a great passage in the, in the beginning of, of John's gospel where Jesus is, he's involved, he's newly involved in his ministry. It's during the first Passover uh, of his uh, earthly vocational ministry. And he, he, he draws a lot of attention and a lot of responses from the people. In fact, John chapter 2 and verse 23 says this, just listen. It says, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. How could you not? How could you not? How could you not see Jesus do supernatural things that you'd never heard of before, never even imagined before, and not be drawn to him and not believe in him? And so that's what happened. But then you go on, verse 24 says this, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means. It means that Jesus didn't have faith in their faith because he knew it was probably not genuine. It was just being caught up in the moment. Remember the parable of the sower? Again, we don't have time to read it, but Jesus told a parable about a man who went out to sow seed one day, and he said as he sowed the seed, it fell on four different kinds of ground that had four different kinds of soil. He said some of it fell on rocky ground where the soil was really shallow, and, it said, and he said in the parable that initially the, a plant began to grow, and it looked healthy, and it looked strong, but as soon as the sun came out with scorching heat, the plant withered and died. Why? Because it had no roots. And that's the way a lot of people are. They have an initial positive response to Jesus, like saying, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. But two weeks later, they're nowhere to be found. And I know this is true because I've seen this in church. I've seen this in my life over the past 30-plus years. I've, every church I've ever served, there are people who come, and they get caught up in the emotion of the moment. Wow, church was an incredible experience, and the music was great, and people were friendly, and I could feel, I could feel the fellowship and the community in the room, and, and, and God's Word spoke to me, and, and I saw people respond with life-changing decisions, and I, I want to be a part of that, and, and it seems like everything is healthy and strong, and then two or three months down the road, they're nowhere to be found. See, Jesus didn't have faith in their faith in John chapter 2, and there was a reason for that. We have to make sure that we abandon, we abandon these uh, initial responses that deceive us into believing that everything is right. When it's not, we have to abandon those empty promises that we make. And we're all guilty of that, I'm sure, on some level. I get so troubled sometimes uh, when people today, in an effort to try to make the gospel message of Jesus seem more attractive to other people, that they share it without really telling somebody what the cost is involved. They share the gospel message, the message of salvation, making it sound like it doesn't really demand anything of your life. And when we do that, you know what we're doing? We're doing a disservice to Jesus first, but we're doing a disservice to the people that we're talking to second. Because Jesus' message of salvation, his message to follow me, is follow me with absolute, complete abandon. Write down the second thing that we need to abandon in our lives. We need to abandon lame excuses. We go on, and there's another disciple said to him, this is verse 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus fo told him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Or in other words, let the dead worry about the dead. You just come and follow me. And again, those words sound really harsh, but we have to understand them in Jewish culture. He wasn't saying, Lord, I want to follow you, but my father just died, so I need to go to the funeral home and take care of his burial. Just give me a little bit of time, and then I'll be back. That's not what he was saying. 
he was saying, Lord, I want to follow you, but I've got this obligation to take care of my aging father, and one day after he dies and after I bury him, then I'll come and follow you. It wasn't I got to go to the funeral home now. It's like, it's like I, I can't do it now. I've got too many other things in my life. We got to get rid of those kinds of excuses when it comes to following Jesus. And it could be an, any number of things for you and me. You know, Lord, I'll follow, I'll follow you, but I, I want to get married first. Or, Lord, I'll follow you, but I want to get my professional life taken care of first. Or, Lord, I'll follow you, but I want to get my children raised first. Lord, I'll follow you, but, but, but. We've got these excuses of other things that really, honestly, have a higher priority in our life than responding to the call, to the compelling call of Jesus. In order to experience the life that he offers, though, that greatness that I was talking about, we got to give up those excuses. We got to put off, we got to give up the tendency to put off what needs to be done and take action now. Remember, I told you that the thing about that story with Peter and Andrew by the Sea of Galilee that made it so special is Jesus walked by and he said, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It says, At once, everyone say at once again, at once, at once they left their nets. And they followed him. At once, they gave up every other thing that was a priority in their life, and they began to follow him. Now, it may seem harsh and it may seem extreme, but the point is, is that we all have these excuses in our lives that keep us, that keep us from doing what Jesus wants us to do. And so, I guess the question that I would have for myself and for all of you and everyone listening across the street or online, wherever you are, is what kind of excuse has kept you from following Jesus fully in your life? And I'm sure there's something. Let me ask you like this. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you felt this conviction in your heart, maybe a burning conviction in your heart that there was something that the Lord wanted you to do, that there was something that he wanted you to give up, or there's something he wanted you to pursue, or there's some kind of service or ministry or action he wanted you to get yourself involved in, and yet you found a reason not to do it? If that's the case, that's the kind of thing that we need to be willing to abandon. Right down next to number three. We need to abandon limited faith. We need to abandon limited faith. We pick up the story in verse 23, and this is a great story. We could preach an entire sermon on this passage. Then he got into the boat. His disciples followed him without warning. A furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. What a great story. Uh, There's a lot we can say about this, but let's just focus on this idea of limited faith. You know, here's the deal. By this time in the story, honestly... By this time, in the disciples' relationship with Jesus, here's what we need to understand. They would have had the experience of seeing him perform many, many, many supernatural miracles. They would have had the experience of having a first row seat to him doing things that no one had ever been able to do before. Again, we said it earlier, you know, causing blind eyes to see, uh, healing people who were stricken with leprosy, casting out demons, causing people who were lame to be able to walk, healing all kinds of sickness. In fact, we're in Matthew chapter 8. We began reading our text in verse 18. If you just look up in Matthew chapter 8 to verse 16, this is what it says. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And so they had seen Jesus do this supernatural healings with just a word. He just spoke a word. That was it. And yet, when they found themselves in the middle of their own crisis, what'd they do? They panicked. A furious storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. That's where they are. Sometimes in the Bible, the Sea of Galilee is called a lake. Sometimes it's called the Lake of Gennesaret. Sometimes the Sea of Galilee. We're talking about the same body of water. It's not a huge body of water. We were there, uh, some of us, just a little over a year ago. And, and I'd always heard and read how easy it was for furious storms to come up on the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret so quickly. And you could tell why when you're there because it sits down kind of in a bowl and there are kind of mountainous areas around it and yet in the mountainous areas there are gaps like big v-shaped gaps at different places that would 
serve the purpose of like a wind tunnel. And if a storm came, it would just sweep up over those mountains and right through those gaps, and it would just, it just hit the water full force. And you could certainly see how that would happen. And so when the storm came into their own life, they panicked, and they woke Jesus up, and they said, save us, we're drowning, we're going to drown, we're going to die. Now, what they should have done in that moment is they should have remembered, remembered what they had seen Jesus been able to do before, they should have remembered how he had demonstrated love and care and provision for them in the past, and they should have woke him up, and they should have said, uh, Lord, we need a little bit of help here. We know you got this. We're not worried about it. Don't want to send the wrong message. We're just going to go sit in this part of the boat. <laughs> Sorry to bother you. We just need a little help. But they panicked, and they said, we're drowning. We're going to die. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to take Jesus seriously, you've got to abandon, you've got to abandon limited faith. What happens is we go through life and storms of life happen for us. And in the, that moment, they cause us to have memory problems. And we forget about how Jesus has always provided for us in the past. We forget about his love and his care and his, and his promise not to ever leave us or forsake us. And it just causes us to panic completely. If you want to take Jesus serious, then you need to have a serious faith. And I don't say that to you lightly this morning because I know that, that living with faith is a challenge. I know that. I know that. I know that sometimes we go to the Lord and we, we take our burdens and our needs and we take the storm of life to him and we ask for his provision and he, he, doesn't do, he doesn't work things out the way that we suppose that he will or the way that we feel like we need him to or we want him to. And sometimes there can be disappointment in that. But at the same time, we still have to understand that we're talking about, when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about the very God of the universe and we have to trust him in all things, in all things. But when storms come into our lives, we can't panic I know it's, it's hard not to face difficult times and not to become overly over, discouraged and just overwhelmed and, 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 and sorrowful, sorrowful. I mean, the, the Apostle Paul even writes in 2 Corinthians about times when he felt sorrowful even unto death. It's hard not to. But we have to abandon limited faith and trust in the Jesus who said in Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer and just know we just know that he's there for us. He doesn't make empty promises. Right down next to number four. I'm doing this quickly. We need to abandon mixed up priorities. We get to the last story in our text, and it's such an interesting story to me. When he begins in verse 28, when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men come from the tombs. Uh, coming from the tombs, met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And this is fascinating to me. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Can you even in your mind imagine a demon-possessed herd of pigs? I have been to an Arkansas Razorback football game before. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Those people are nuts. <laughs> we can get crazy sometimes. But I, I can't even imagine what a demon-possessed herd of pigs look like. But it says, they said, if, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they went out and went into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. I guess you could say this is the first example in the world of deviled ham right here. <laughs> uh, okay, everyone just say, ugh, that was bad, but I couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist it. Let me tell you, I think two things happen here, and one of them is really significant in our context. The first one I think is possible is that, you know, I think the people living in that region probably were already afraid because there were these two demon-possessed men, and other, other descriptions of them in, the, in other gospel accounts are pretty, pretty, pretty bad, shrieking, naked, breaking chains whenever they tried to chain, catch them and chain them up, just this overwhelming 
demonic power and darkness in them. So much so that we're even told in Matthew's gospel, they wouldn't even go into that region. They wouldn't even come near them. So I think when the guys went into town and told the rest of the people in town what had happened, they came out and they saw dead pigs floating in the water and they saw these two previously demon-possessed men probably just sitting calmly and quietly on the ground with clothes on like normal people and they saw Jesus. I think it's possible they could have been so overwhelmed and frightened by what they didn't understand that they just looked at Jesus and said, just go. We don't even want you here. I think that's, don't you think that's possible? But I think another possibility, and this is the con- in the context of what we're talking about, is they came out, they saw the dead pigs, they saw these two previously demon-possessed men, they saw Jesus, and the truth is, they valued those pigs more than they valued those men. They had written off those men a long time ago. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think we're ever guilty of doing that? Seeing people that are so far gone or so different from us or so live in such lives that we can't understand that we just, I mean, in our mind, literally, we're just like, we're done with them. We don't have any regard for them. And I think that could have been a possibility here too. And so that's obviously mixed up priorities for them because you can't read the Gospels and not see that Jesus values people above what? Everything. 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 And so when we have moments in our lives when we value our, our, our lives or anything related to our lives, we value our comfort, our desires, our livelihood, our possession, our possessions, the thing, what we understand, and we value those things above everything else so that when we look at some people, we just we have no time for them, then we're in, we're in a bad place. We're not following Jesus with abandon there because that's not the way Jesus is. We need to... Abandon those kinds of mixed up priorities. And that's difficult. It's difficult for all of us. But Jesus came for everyone. Jesus' invitation to follow me is for everyone, even people that could not be more different than you and me. Well, we're out of time. Brian can come. We'll close. I hope that that sparked something inside of you as we looked through those verses together, and we talked about that together. We need to take Jesus seriously, and that means we have to make sacrifices in our lives. That's why he said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. We have to abandon things that hold us back from taking him seriously. The bottom line is this. We need to quit playing games with God and get serious about Jesus. You know, I read an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal a while back, and it was all about why people... Today, we'll spend lots of money on athletic clothes and workout clothes, but never do anything athletic or work out. <laughs> Seriously. It said there's a growing trend in the athletic apparel market where people are buying sports clothes without actually practicing the sport. It said the U.S. athletic apparel market will increase by nearly 50% to more than $100 billion at retail by 2020, driven in large part by consumers snapping up stretchy tees, leggings, leggings, and things that will never see the fluorescent light of a gym. (laughs) For instance, sales of yoga apparel increased by 45%, but yoga participation grew by less than 5%. But the trend isn't limited to yoga. It says outdoor and camping retailers have debuted new lines of hiking boots and flannel shirts for people who probably have no intention of actually hiking or camping. Retailers are are rolling out jogging pants that sell for as much as $90 for men who never jog. And the article quoted one buyer who likes to wear yoga pants around town but who seldom has time to work out. And she said, when you put on your workout apparel, you think, huh, maybe I should think about working out today. (laughs) But I don't. We're not that different in church sometimes. We're not that different in church. It's not enough just to embrace Jesus on some level. He expects us to follow him with abandon.